I need some traction. My name is Dan Olson. For those of you that haven't met, I want to share some advice on how to achieve product market fit. Who here is a product man? Who works in product management here? Awesome. Cool. I'm going to keep your hands up. I want to get a picture of, of I, I, while I'm up here, we have such a big group here. I'd love to get a quick picture if I could, and it's got to be a pano given the size of this room. All right, ready? Okay. Hold your hands up. Okay, nobody move. Don't move. I'm joking. You can move. All right, cool. It's going to complain I'm going too fast. All right, wow, look at that. Slow down. It's telling me to slow down. Uh, cool, awesome, thanks. Cool. So, since we have, it's so rare to get, we're all so busy you know, with our day jobs, we usually don't have time to go to a lot of conferences. So, thanks for coming out today. It's so rare to get product managers together that when we do get product managers together, I like to share one of the most closely held product management secrets that there is, and that's a product manager's motto. I don't know if some of you have heard of it. Maybe I'm guessing a lot of you haven't heard of it yet because it's pretty closely guarded secret. It's a bit like Spider-Man's motto. Does anyone here know Spider-Man's motto? Yell it out. With great power comes great responsibility. That's Spider-Man's motto. That's right. The PM motto is similar. It's just a little different. And it's with responsibility comes no power. <laughs> um, sad but true. We're laughing on the outside, but we're crying a little bit on the inside, right? Don't we wish we had a little? People would listen to us more. We didn't have to influence without authority as much. Um, well, we're responsible for a lot of things as product managers. One of the main things we're responsible for is product market fit. And product market fit is a term that was actually coined by Mark Andreessen um, of Netscape fame, who's now um, a famous venture capitalist, in a blog post back in 2007. Um, but, and it got more popular with the Lean Startup Movement, but there wasn't a lot of great guidance on how to achieve it. Uh, people would kind of talk about it simplistically, like, oh yeah, Box? Box succeeded because they had product market fit. Startup X, sadly, Startup X failed because they did not have product market fit. And um, working as a product leader and as a consultant, uh, I basically saw kind of a meta pattern of what needs to hold true in order to achieve product market fit. And that's why I wrote my book, The Lean Product Playbook. It's basically a guide on how to achieve product market fit. And I'm going to share some advice uh, from that book that hopefully you can apply tomorrow when you get back to your job on, on how to achieve product market fit. The key framework is the product market fit pyramid. So I want to walk you through this real quick. It's a pyramid that has five layers. And the idea is you can think of each of the layers as um, one of the key hypotheses that you need to get right in order to achieve product market fit. So you need to be right enough on each of these five layers. And like a real pyramid, each layer builds on top of the other layer. So at the bottom of the pyramid, we have the target customer. Everything starts with this. Whose life are we trying to make better? Whose pain points are we trying to address? Um, the next layer up is for that customer that we just got done specifying, what are their underserved needs? Right, we want to focus on needs. A lot of times, we'll talk about this in a sec, people just jump into features and solutions right away. We all want to take a breath and stop and think about what are their needs, and more specifically, what are the ones that are underserved or unmet that we might be able to address. And taken together, these two layers represent the market. Right, that's, if you look in an economics or marketing textbook, it'll say the definition of a market is a, a, a set of people that share a set of common needs. Right? And, uh, and you don't actually control the market. What you, you can decide which market you want to go after, but you can't force them to do things, right? What you control are the three product layers, which I like to represent with your value proposition, which in an ideal world builds right on top of those underserved needs layer. Um, and that's basically what needs are we going to promise to customers that our product delivers, and how are we going to do so in a way that's better or different than the other products that are out there. So that's where product strategy lives. The next layer up is feature set. What functionality are we going to build that's going to convey those benefits? And this is where the concept of MVP comes in, so that we don't overscope or overbuild before we go too far and confirm whether we're going in the right direction or not. And then finally, user experience. That's what the customer actually uses, to use the functionality to get the benefits, right? And again, you can view each of these as one of the five hypotheses you need to get right enough. And product market fit is just how well, given the execution and assumptions we're making in the top three layers, how well do they resonate with the target market that we're going after, right? So that's the product market. That's my definition of what it takes to have product market fit. And if any one of these is significantly off, it's going to impede your ability to achieve product market fit. And this is obviously meant to be iterative. I realized that, hey, once I have this set of five hypotheses, I can create a process to guide people through um, forming those hypotheses and iterating them. And the specifics will obviously be different for your business. But the process is just the lean product process. As you start at the bottom, you, you state, what are my assumptions about who our target customer is? Then you go to step two, what do we think their underserved needs are? What should our value prop be? Again, which is how are we going to be better or different than the competition? What should that MVP feature set be? What should the user experience design be? And then it's just once you've got to that point, 
you've got this UX design that represents all the work you've done up to that point in the pyramid. And I'm a big fan of testing with prototypes before you actually code anything. I'm going to close out with a case study of doing that. It's very powerful. But there's one last step is once you do have a UX, whether it's a prototype or a live product, we close the loop and we go and we test with customers to see where we're at with product market fit. That's the lean product process. Again, the specifics will vary for your product. The details will be different, but these are the, basically the steps to follow to um, try to achieve product market fit. Um, I'm going to jump in. I only have 35 minutes today, so I'm going to skip to our customer. It's obviously very important. I talk about in other talks uh, how to use segmentation techniques to get clear, how to use personas to capture your assumptions. But I'm going to jump in on step two, assuming we have a tentative hypothesis of our target customer, uh, and talk about their underserved needs. Right? And an important concept here is the idea of problem space versus solution space. Who's heard of problem space here before? Some folks? Great. OK. Yeah, more and more folks are talking about it, which is great. Let me explain. A problem space is a customer problem, need, or benefit that the product should address. That's what the problem space is. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the Agile user story template, right? As a blank, I want a blank so I can blank. Most people know that, probably. Yeah. That so I can is basically the essence of the problem statement, right? the problem space. Like, what is it? How is it going to create value for that user? In contrast, solution space is a specific implementation or design to address that need. Let's say on the problem space side, I wanted to create a way, make it easier for people to share photos with their friends. Right? That statement, make it easier to share photos with their friends, that's in the problem space. If the next thing I said was, and oh, by the way, the last year, I'm on an app, oops, and um, here's the app, that app that actually lets you share photos would be in the solution space. Or if I said, hey, my friend Bill uh, is a great designer, and he created a set of mock-ups, that set of mock-ups would be in the solution space. So that's the difference. The need you're trying to address is in the problem space, and the designs or the implementation or products are in the solution space. And what happens is way too many teams just go rushing right into solution space without spending enough time thinking about the problems they're trying to solve, right? And I understand, like, at the end of the day, deliver, the developers have to ship code. They have to ship stuff in the solution space. Designers have to design mock-ups. That's in the solution space, right? We live in the solution space. So it's, it's kind of unnatural almost. It's a learned skill to say, let me stop and think about the problem space. But at the end of the day, if developers develop and designers design, what a PM's main job? I think our main job is to make sure that our team understands the problem space and our customers, but a problem space definition of what we're trying to solve so that we can make sure that the solutions we're going to build are actually going to solve some problems. Uh, I'd like to illustrate this with an example. When NASA was sending astronauts into space, they knew that the ballpoint pens we use here on Earth wouldn't work because there's no gravity, right? And I'll say right up front, if you Google this, you'll end up on some like urban legend site. It says this is all baloney or something. It's actually not, the key issue is did NASA pay the money or not. And NASA didn't pay the money. And NASA didn't ask anybody to do it. One of NASA's contractors proactively said, you know what? I think we can invent a pen that writes in space. And they went off and spent a million dollars of their own money, not NASA's money, and they invented a space pen. Right? Um, I, I have one. I, I've never had a chance to use it in space, but it works apparently. It doesn't need gravity to, to write in space. Right? So mission accomplished. The solution works. The Russians were also sending astronauts into space, and faced with the same challenge, they gave their astronauts pencils. And you can actually get a Russian space pen. It's a cheeky joke, poking fun at this, right? It's just a pencil, red pencil in a box, right? Poking fun at them. So why do I share this example? One, the obvious thing is if these are both equally good solutions to the problem of writing in zero gravity, then the one that didn't take a million dollars and all that time and effort is clearly higher ROI and better, right? That's the obvious thing. The more subtle thing is even when you're trying to be in the problem space and stay in the problem space, that pull in the solution space is so strong that you can sometimes pollute your thinking and let some solution space stuff creep in. This happens all the time. So when the person, the head of that company said, hey, I think we can invent a pen that writes in space, and that was ostensibly his problem space statement, he had some solution pollution in his requirement. What was his pollution that he had? Pen, yeah, he actually had the word pen, not surprising because it was a pen company, so it makes sense that he would have tunnel vision. But he basically you know, constrained the solution space from the get-go. It would have been better if he'd just been vague and said a way to write in space. That would have been better. And in general, how does this happen on our feature teams? You, know, you may have a JIRA ticket that says, add a drop-down, add an API call, you know, add this wizard, add this menu. Those are all solution space articulations, right? And it, it's, it's very helpful if you know what the problem is. Um, instead of just jumping right to the solution and putting it in there, because maybe we can come up with a better solution. And the bottom line is, we want to um, peel the onion. Because usually the first idea we come up with, whether it's for a customer or for problems, is at the outer layer of an onion. 
And the, the, the trick to product market fit is peeling the onion, getting savvier and savvier about exactly who your customers are, what their needs are, um, and what the highest priority needs are, which you're going to learn iteratively as you go through customer discovery and validation. All right, so we want to get clear on customer benefits. Once we do that, the next thing that we want to do is find our value proposition. So once we've brainstormed all the benefits that we can do, it's actually fun. Um, you brainstorm and explore the problem space and create a problem space definition. The next thing we want to do is get clear on how is our product going to be better or different than the other products that are out there, right? And that's your value proposition step. Um, the underserved part I'm skipping in the interest of time, I do have an importance versus satisfaction framework that you can use to kind of get a handle on, hey, is this a well-served need versus an underserved need? Um, we probably want to go for the ones that are more underserved as opposed to the ones that people are happy with. But back on value prop again, it basically answers two questions. Out of all the things we brainstorm, what are we actually going to tell customers our product does for them? What need is it going to address? And how will it be better than the competition that's out there? And the framework that I like to use for this to, uh, to bring this to life and help think about this is the Kano model. Who's heard of the Kano model here? All right, we've got a lot more people. By the way, those of you sitting in the back, we have a lot of seats over there if you want. Feel free to go around. Um, let me walk through the Kano model real quick, and I'll show you how we can apply it to get really clear on our value proposition. So uh, on the horizontal axis, it talks about how fully does the product meet the given need, whatever need we're talking about, save time, save money, um, whatever need we're talking about, from not at all, you can think of that like 0% met, all the way to fully met, 100% met. Right? And then on the vertical axis, it shows as a result of how much the product meets that need, how much user satisfaction or dissatisfaction results. I do. And if this all seems a little complicated, the cool thing about the Kano model is it breaks everything down, all the benefits and features into one of three categories. I'm going to walk you through and explain. Oh. The first and, and most obvious one hand. is kind of a performance benefit or feature. And, then, yeah. and the way to think about this is the more the product meets this need, the more customer satisfaction is created. Yeah. The less the product meets the need, the less customer satisfaction is created, right? So more is better, less is worse. This is pretty straightforward. If we were in the microprocessor business and our chip was 15% faster than everybody else's, we'd be outperforming everybody by 15%. That's an example. Performance benefits, you can usually someone must be given a and quantify how, how you're doing that, right? <laughs> Let's say I was shopping it's for okay, a car. It's okay. A new car, I went into the showroom and there were two cars and I liked the way the two cars looked pretty much about the same. I looked at the spec sheet on the window, they're pretty comparable, but then all of a sudden I realized, hey, one of these cars has twice the uh, fuel economy, you know, it gets twice the, in the state miles per gallon, right, that, uh, than the other car. Um, all other things being equal, I'd pick that car because for most people, fuel efficiency is a performance benefit or feature. So that's performance. More is better, less is worse. The second category is a little different. It's must-haves. Now, a must-have, if the product meets, fully meets the must-have, it doesn't actually make any customers happy. They're expecting those must-haves to be met. But if they're not met, right, then it makes them unhappy. That's the definition of a must-have. I know sometimes some key stakeholders may say, we must have this feature. This is kind of the customer de definition of a must-have feature. If you don't have it, they're annoyed. If you have it, they're like, okay, no big deal. I expected it there. You're not actually making me happy. Uh, sticking with cars. Say I was shopping for a new car, and I went to the showroom, and I saw a car that I really liked the way it looked. And I looked at the, uh, the spec sheet, and I liked the specs. But then I peeked inside the car, and I realized, hey, this car doesn't have any seatbelts. I wouldn't buy it because I'd be afraid of getting hurt or dying, right? But if car A has five seatbelts and car B has 100 seatbelts, I don't say car B is 20 times better than car A. Once you have one seatbelt per person, oop, uh, you're, pretty much, you're pretty much good to go. The last one is delighters. So not having a delighter or wow feature doesn't cause any problem because people aren't expecting it to be there. But by having a wow feature, it can create a lot of positive value. So sticking with cars, not today, but if we roll back the clock to when the first cars came out with GPS navigation, it was a delighter. Right? Before that, people were getting lost or printing out you know, Google Maps or MapQuest or asking for directions. And then all of a sudden, the first few cars have GPS. You just put in the address of where you're going, fundamentally changed um, how you got from point A to point B. But as we know, over time, more and more cars got GPS navigation. TomTom Tom and Garmin came out with their add-on units, basically. And, uh, and now we all just get around with our phones. So it's not a dynamic picture. I forgot to mention those market layer, those needs, the needs don't change anywhere near as quickly as the solutions do, right? You know, think about that. We had GPS in the car. We had the add-on units. Now we just use our phones, right? Three different technology waves solving the same fundamental need of how do I get from point A to point B, basically, right? 
they're doing a better job over time. So those market needs, the markets don't change as much. In the book, I talk about the, another market, the desire to listen to music on the go. I'm sure a lot of you like to listen to music on the go. These days, we all use our phones. But what was the original product? Probably an FM transistor radio. And then in the 80s, we're all cool with our Walkman, right? And then we got MP3 players and then iPods, and now we use it. So again, that need to listen to music on the go didn't change, but the technology waves came and went. The other thing is it also illustrates the GPS thing illustrates this isn't a static picture, right? Now we're all using our phones. We're not using the GPS in the cars. That the uh, needs and features migrate over time. So that yesterday's providers become today's performance features, become tomorrow's must-haves. And the pace with which that happens just depends on the level of competition and innovation in your space, right? So why am I telling you all this about the Kingdom Mall? Again, all that matters is there's three categories. So once we brainstorm our problem space and all the benefits we could apply, uh, uh, solve for people, all we do is we categorize them into must-haves, performance, and delighters. And then we put them into a grid that I call the value proposition grid. And so I've kept this example generic. We're going to go into a real-world example in a sec, but the way to form this grid is for your product category, for your onion, whatever you're trying to do, whether it's help people with their taxes or help small businesses with their payroll, whatever that market need you're trying to address, list out one per row, what are the must-have benefits for my market category, what are the performance benefits for my market category, and what are the delighters. That's step one. Step two is add a column for each of your key competitors and a column for yourself. In this case, I've shown two competitors. You know, you can have three, four, five. You know, I wouldn't go much more than six or seven, otherwise it gets a little busy. But that's the second step. The next step is you just score how good a job each of your competitors is doing on each of these benefits, right? And so you can use, I mean, high, medium, low works pretty well. If you do have numbers, say you were like in the chip business and you wanted to put some you know, gigahertz numbers in there, you could do that. But low, medium, high works fine, you know, or if you want four levels, uh, as long as the relative ratings make sense. So, and, and then for must-haves and delighters, you can usually just use yes or no. It works pretty well. So in this case, um, you know, both of our competitors, of course, have the must-have. Competitor A is the best at performance benefit one. Competitor B is the best at performance benefit two. They're both so-so performance benefit three. And competitor A has this delighter. This is the backdrop upon which we want to figure out how are we going to How's our product going to win in the marketplace and do a better job, right? And I would say probably less than 5 to 10% of product um, teams ever go through an exercise like this, right? And it's easy because you, you, know, you get sucked into the day-to-day -day with your, your scrums every time. But how do we pull back and make sure we're really delivering a differentiated product? Um, and one of my favorite definitions, I run a lot of workshops. And when I run a lot of workshops and we get to this point, a lot of teams will fill that right column high, 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 like four highs, right? <laughs> And is that really realistic? It's not. We don't have that. We all like, you know, we just had a dinner last night. We were complaining about how we don't have enough developers to go around. You can't, you don't have enough developers to be high on all these, one. Two, it wouldn't be a clear positioning in the marketplace. It wouldn't be a focused positioning. And speaking of which, April is going to talk about positioning next. So given this, we want to pick our battles. My favorite definition of strategy is saying no. It means saying no to something. Where are we going to say no? So given this backdrop, we might go with something like this. Of course, we're going to have the must-have. We're not going to try to be the best at performance benefit one. We're going to be between our competitors. We're going to say no to performance benefit two. We're going to you know, make the tough call and say no. We're going to try to be the best at performance benefit three. You know, maybe we've identified a market segment that really values that benefit, or we have some unique solution ideas as to how we can deliver more value. And then we have our own you know, delighter idea that we have. What matters the most from this exercise is what's called your unique differentiators. What you're doing is trying to figure out, oops, they're off a little bit is what's your special sauce? It should be the high and the yes, basically, right? What, where are you going to outperform everybody else, and what unique delighters do you have? That's what matters the most. You don't compete on must-haves. And one of the top mistakes I see people do with an MVP is it only has the must-haves. And you test with customers, how do you think they feel about it? They're not excited about an MVP that only has must-haves. So we want to get clear on this special sauce so that when we get to the next stage of MVP feature, you know, features and UX, we make sure our our, uh, our UX prototype has, or MVP, has this in it so we can test whether it's resonating with people or not. All right, so that's a generic example. I'm gonna, I need some audience participation for this next one. We're going to talk about a real-world example, and we're going to try to apply this. Um, who's familiar with Instagram here? All right, cool. That's why I pick it, right? Okay, cool. So when Instagram came out, now everybody uses it. But when we've got to roll the clock back. When it first came out, there were already a lot of other mobile photo sharing apps on the market, right? What did marketplace? they come in and quickly shoot up to number one. Every once in a while, you see a product do this. They enter a crowded marketplace, they shoot up to number one. I 
personally think you can almost always explain why that happened, like the physics behind it, using the value prop grid and the Kano model. Let's try to do that for Instagram. So we can't think about Instagram today. Let's go back in time to when it first came out. Think about, for those of you that used it when it first came out, let's think about what were the unique differentiators. How do they outperform the other mobile apps, or how do they out-delight the other mobile apps that are out there? Any thoughts? Filters, that's right, awesome. That's the first answer I usually get. Filters are great. Back to problem and solution. Are filters a problem or a solution? They're a solution, that's totally fine, it's all good. What you do to the hack if somebody proposes a solution is you say, oh, why? Why is that valuable to people? So whoever said it, why is it valuable to have filters? Couldn't use Photoshop, yeah. Anybody else, why filters create value for you? The skin looked better, cool. The blemish remover, okay, yeah. Or more Tinder hits? No, you've got a clear goal. That's good. <laughs> Customizable, yeah, yeah. So usually you can see this is the thing about the problem space. It's messy. Different people have different reasons for why. Usually I hear things like, hey, it makes my photos look better, makes my photos look more creative, makes me look more artistic, that, all that kind of stuff, right? We can all kind of bundle it together. Makes my photos look better. Great. So we have a benefit, make my photos look better, supported by the feature of filters. Now, is that a performance or a delighter? It's a delighter. No one else had these awesome filters, right? So just you weren't expecting them. They blew you away by having them. Awesome. So we got one delighter. Any other delighters or any other outperformance things from back in the day? Community. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I think different ones had different communities. I think that was, might have been a factor. Yeah. Anybody else? Hashtags I hear. Yeah. Gib? Wicked easy to share stuff. Wicked easy to share stuff. How was it easy? What made it easy? Uh, okay, okay. So they were around a long time ago. Do you guys remember, like, you used to have like, to upload your photos. It actually would take a little while. Does anyone recall that it seemed to be faster on Instagram than the other apps? So that was, it actually was faster than on Instagram. And they actually wrote a blog post about this. Now, how the heck did they do this, right? How did they do this? It was actually a clever UX hack. What they did, all the other photo sharing apps, because it was like early in the photo sharing app industry, right? So all the other apps, the way they worked is you'd open up your app, it would have a camera, you'd take your picture, and then it would show you the picture in the app, and you'd check it out, and then you'd eventually hit the upload button to share it, right? That's how it was. Well, the, the, the Instagram UX team just said, you know what? Like 90 plus percent of the time, people upload the photo. So why don't we just start uploading it the second it's done taking, the second it's done, and then by the time they hit, your finger hits that button, like two or three seconds have passed. That's what they did. They took advantage of that slack time. They just started uploading it. And so everyone that used it was like, oh my gosh, it's uploading three seconds faster than everybody else. It was a clever UX hack. So that was their performance, right? Because they're outperforming. We can say, hey, everybody else has taken seven to nine seconds to upload. They're going like four to six seconds to upload. That's a performance benefit. Okay. There's one other thing that they do. It's a little more subtle than filters that makes your photos look good. Anybody have ideas on what they do to make your, what they did to make your photos look good? Yeah. Square aspect ratio, right? I don't know if you remember. First time I remember using Instagram, I'm like, hey, why are you cropping my photo, right? Because when you take a photo, the rectangle can be a tall portrait one or it can be a horizontal landscape one. And the photo itself, there's no problem. It'll look great. The problem is when you try to bring those two different shapes together into a single fixed width feed, guess what? The landscape has to get shrunk down in order to fit in the feed. They didn't want to have this janky feed with different sizes. They wanted everything to look beautiful. That's why they did the square aspect ratio. So exactly, right? So that's another one that supports making your photos look good. Uh, cool. So let's go fill out the grid, OK? So here's the grid, right? Other photo sharing apps. We can just lump them all together. Instagram, must-haves, performance, and delighters. Let's fill in based on what we just said. We didn't even talk about the must-haves, but obviously, if you're a photo sharing app, you need to let people share their photos, and everybody has that. The performance benefit was post my photos quickly. Everyone else is low. They're high because of that clever UX hack that they had. And then the, the delighter was make my photos look good, supported by filters and the square aspect ratio. All right? Uh, that's basically it. So this is how I explain, and there's a unique differentiator. That's how I explain why Instagram is able to enter a crowded market and become number one, because they had a very, very clear, strong value proposition. And you'll notice they have a combination of outperform and a delighter. And you don't have to have both. At a minimum, you need to have an outperform. But time and again, when you see someone come into a category and dominate it, it's because they have this powerful one-two punch of a clear outperform, uploading photos more quickly, and then this awesome delighter that nobody expected. And that's how they basically do that. Yeah. And if you, you, if once you start seeing things through this lens, you can go back and reverse engineer. I've done that for Uber and others too. 
All right, the next step, once we get clear on what our special sauce is going to be in our value prop, we want to get clear on our MVP feature sets. I don't have time to get in the details here, but basically, this is where you, the whole time now, steps one through three, we've been in the problem space, right? We haven't talked about features. Now is where we bridge the features. And for each of those benefits, like, hey, make my photos look pretty, make my photos look good, then you do a brainstorming and say, what are all the different feature ideas that we have? And you would come up with aspect ratio and you come up with filters and other stuff that you would do, right? Um, and that's where you actually brainstorm and you bridge to, from problem space to solution space. And then you can have the tough debate. This is one of the toughest things in product management is to make that call on what should be in your MVP. And the temptation is to pull everything in, right? The way it goes is someone in the company goes, are you crazy? We're not going to have feature X in the MVP? I don't know. I'm gonna, either I'm going to be embarrassed or VP XYZ is going to be pissed off or customer X is going to complain. Like, that's how it goes, right? And you got to resist that temptation, otherwise it's a slippery slope, and next thing you know, you're pulling all these features in, your MVP is getting bloated, right? So it's a tough thing. I have some advice in my other talks and in the book about that. The next step is, once we have the tough debates on what's in the MVP feature set, and again, we want to make sure our special sauce is in there. Whatever those unique differentiators are, we want to make sure our MVP has it. The next step is to create a prototype. Uh, this is where UX design comes in. Up until now, we've been co basically covering words, talking, you know, it's all been words and problem space and solution space. And now we need to create a prototype. And I, wanted, I don't have a lot of time to share a lot of stuff, but I want to share a process that I've found helpful to go from an idea of what your MVP feature set is to working through your UX design and also testing and validating it with users. And the way I like to categorize and describe this process is with um, this framework of fidelity from low to high. So fidelity means how closely does it resemble the final polished product? That would be the highest fidelity possible. And then as we get cruder and cruder approximations, it would be lower fidelity. And then on the y-axis is interactivity. Obviously, the final live product is going to be fully interactive. So the prototypes and artifacts that we're creating, you know, how much can you do with them? Are they static? Can you actually do a few things or what? How interactive are they compared to the final product? In the bottom left corner, lowest interactivity, lowest fidelity, we have the awesome hand sketch, right? Whether it's on a whiteboard or on paper, this is a great first step for teams to jump in and say, okay, we, we threw, a lot of, threw around a lot of words. Let's start getting some hand sketches for our UX design. And so teams can iterate here until they're happy. And then the next step that I like to do is watch. And you'll see it says clickable there or tappable, right? Um, and now it's higher fidelity interactivity because we're actually using a digital tool like Balsamic. Does anyone here use Balsamic? Yeah, I'm a huge fan of Balsamic. If you're... You know, a lot of times in other talks, I talk about the UX design gap that a lot of people have. You know, some people are fortunate to have fully staffed, high, highly skilled designers at their beck and call 24-7 as much as they need. I'm sure a lot of us in this room don't, for, you know, and maybe at certain points in time, they're understaffed or whatever. Um, I, I'm a big fan of people learning how to wireframe, and Balsamic makes it super easy. So if you've been curious about learning how to wireframe, I recommend checking out Balsamic. The cool thing about Balsamic and the other tools that are out there, frankly, all of them, is that when you create a widget, like say I'm going to add a menu, it's got built in, okay, when the user taps or clicks on that, where do you want it to go? And you can say, okay, when they tap on this button, it's going to go to this other wireframe, and when they do this, it's going to go here. And you can string together a series of like, you know, 10 to 15 pages or screens and create a pretty cool experience uh, automatically. It's really easy. In the old days, these would be static, but these days it's easy to make them. And so this is a great place to get initial tests. The other thing is it's lower fidelity. These are usually grayscale, right? Because uh, people are so wired to focus on the visuals. You know, the number of times I've taken a prototype that the teams worked really hard on to some exec, and we've had all these tough discussions about value prop and MVP feature set and layout, information architecture. And we show them the result of all of our work, and they say, what's this color green that you use? I don't like this green. That's the first thing they interact with. So to avoid that, to kind of put horse blinders on, wireframes tend to be grayscale. You don't worry about the font yet. You don't worry about the images. So people have to engage on what's on the page, what's the layout, what's the visual hierarchy, things like that. Anyway, you can actually test with this, though, too. Back to the MVP debate, if, um, if an MVP debate, if uh, you know, there's a feature someone's debating that we should put in, one of my favorite hacks is don't put it in the wireframe and see if any customers complain. And if they complain, then you say, I guess you were right. We've got to put it in. But if they don't complain, it's like, well, I guess we don't have to do it for MVP. Because if you bite the bullet and put in the MVP, you've, you bit the bullet. The next thing up, so you can test to work through major issues on functionality and layout. Then the next layer up is clickable or tappable mockups, basically, right? 
And uh, here, you know, your designer, this is higher fidelity. Now we will have fonts and colors and images, right? Your designer will export, it will use Sla, uh, will sketch, you know, sketch, Illustrator, Photoshop, and they'll export some images. The cool thing is InVision and other tools let you basically take those images, upload them, and create little hot spots. You say, okay, if they click here, tap here, it's going to go to this other thing, right? So again, you can string together this high fidelity, happy path of, of what people can check out. So this is where I spend most of my time validating and testing and working through the kinks and working through issues and rinsing and repeating. Once you get to this point and people don't have any real complaints and you start to hear people say, oh, this is actually pretty cool, I can see using it, then you can very confidently proceed with going to the highest fidelity, highest interactivity live product, right? So this is what I mean by validating with prototypes before you go to live product. And I'm going to close out with an example of that. And then I recommend testing your live product because, you know, the mock-ups don't have browser compatibility issues or performance issues or anything like that. So again, that's a way to work through your design and test it iteratively. The last step in the process, once we have our shiny mock-ups, is to test our MVP with customers. Just to tie it back, we've, at this point, we've worked our way all the way up to step five. We've got this you know, balsamic or this InVision uh, UX or a live product. It's time to close the loop. Uh, and it's important to make sure that we're talking to the people that we started out targeting in the first place. One mistake I see people make is they just go talk to anybody now and you get kind of scattered feedback. So again, in my other talks, I have advice on how to conduct the interviews and things like that. So just to close out, I want to share a case study of this process applied end to end. It was for a project called marketingreport.com. Um, the team was very small. It was a startup that had an existing product and the CEO had an idea for a new product and he wanted me to come in and validate it and test it. And he was the one who said, hey, you know what? We have so few developers, we can't do any coding on this. Maybe you can talk to my eng manager for a couple meetings, but that's it. Like, you have to do as much as you can with prototypes. I said, that sounds great. First step in the process, target customer. This had to do with basically blocking um, junk mail. So like if I, you guys go home tonight or tomorrow in your mailbox, you're gonna, who gets junk mail here? Anybody? Yeah, they found you too, huh? Yeah. So direct mail is a euphemism for that. But basically why, say I go home and there's a coupon cat litter addressed to me. Why did I get a coupon for cat litter? Well, because in some marketing database in the cloud, you know, it says Dan Olson has a cat. And the CEO had worked in the credit industry. So if you think about credit, today we're all very empowered. We can see our credit scores. We can see our credit report. If somebody says we didn't pay a bill but they're wrong, we can fight it and get it fixed, right? We're very, there's a lot of transparency and empowerment. But if you go back to the, you know, 50 years ago, you would apply for a loan or credit card. You just put in your social security number. It would go off into some black box and come back and say approved or declined and you wouldn't know why. So he had worked in credit and wanted to do the same kind of transformation of transparency and empowerment for junk mail or marketing mail. So I said, great, target market. You all raise your hands. Everybody that gets junk mail, that was the target market in the US. The second thing was, okay, let's talk about customer benefits. The main idea was learn why I received the junk mail I received. That was the main problem space idea. Like, why am I getting this cat letter coupon? And the top feature idea was a marketing report, which was like a credit report that had a marketing profile, which would have info about you, like, hey, Dan has a cat, Dan has two kids. Dan owns a home, things like that. And then a marketing score, which was going to be a credit score where higher is better. That was the main idea. And then one of the execs said, well, in addition to that, I want to test the idea of money saving offers. What if I don't have a cat, but I have a dog? Can I raise my hand and say, please have food coupons? Can I do that? He had a theory that maybe some people wanted to compare how much they're spending on different things to other people. Social networking was hot at the time. Social networking just got thrown in there, right? Um, pure solutions based uh, idea with no real basis. And then the other exec didn't care about the blue stuff. What he cared about was the yellow stuff. He said, well, how about we also test the idea of just reducing junk mail overall since we're saving. And then since we're, we're you know, saving all this paper, maybe we can make some environmental save trees claim. So I iterated with them to get this point. I said, OK, is everybody's ideas on the board? They said, yes. Next step in the process, what's the MVP, right? And I looked at this. I said, this is too big for a single MVP. So what we did is we created two MVPs. We took the core green stuff plus the yellow and said that's, gonna, that's one product MVP concept. We call it the shield because it's going to shield you. And then we took the core green plus the blue and called that the marketing saver because it's going to save you money. So we had two sets of features. That, the green stuff was identical between the two prototypes, right? So then we went to the next step and created our prototype. This is an example. I would call this medium fidelity, right? It's just a bunch of words. We didn't really spend a lot of time designing it. And then once you clicked in, you get to this page. Basically, each of those feature blocks from that MVP was one of these blocks, and then you could click learn more and go to a page to interact with that feature. So we had this, you know, about 10, 10 screen in vision prototype. I ran it through user testing. There were a lot of questions and concerns. What, what, what was the result? So I, here's that same diagram now, color coded. 
Um, green doesn't mean slam dunk ship it. Green means, well, there are a lot of questions and concerns, but we feel like we have a handle on it. And if we just address these questions and concerns, we can, we can, there's a chance to create value there, we feel. Yellow meant low appeal. Red meant they hated it, didn't understand it, right? So the first thing is, did we get any green? Yes, we got green. The second thing is, did we get, remember the core idea was this stuff? Did we get any green in the core idea? No. Thank goodness we tested something else. And this happens all the time, right? These kind of pivots, when you get out there and the market pulls you in a different direction, happen all the time. I'm sure you're familiar with Flickr, right? Flickr, the photo sharing site. It didn't start out as a photo sharing site. It started out as a game. The game wasn't taken off, but the photo sharing capability they built did, so they pivoted to that. And I'm sure a lot of you use Slack. You may not know this. Slack also started out by, as a game. The game wasn't doing well, but this cool communication tool was taken off. The other thing you may not know is that was the same entrepreneur, Stuart. So they say he's the world's worst game designer, but richest game designer in the world. <laughs> so pivoting happens all the time, right? And there were a lot of questions and concerns. So luckily, we found an island of green here, an island of green here. And we had to decide, are we going to pivot that way? Are we going to pivot that way? We decided to pivot to these two green boxes uh, because it was more consistent with the brand, and there was a better value prop there. The cool thing is we didn't do any coding, so we had no problem throwing away our prototype and starting from scratch. And we made sure the new prototype, I had six pages of notes, addressed every little question or concern that we heard. So gone was marketingreport.com. We pivoted to junk mail freeze, right? And I learned a lot of things. Uh, we learned not all mail is the same. There's some mail that really bothers people. It's like the financial mail, like cash advance checks and things like that. Uh, other things. People said, I said, hey, tell me what you do when you get your mail. They're like, well, Dan, I grab it and I go to my shredder and I go shred, shred, shred. Does anyone here shred their mail like every time? I don't do that. I didn't know about that. I'm like, well, how much time do you spend shredding mail? They're like five minutes a day. So we had a whole save time benefit that wasn't even in our grid before, right? We were missing a save time benefit. So we added spend less time. There's a lot of other things we learned, little silly things. We had said save trees. Multiple people said, well, how many trees are you going to save? So we put in 43 trees. Second time around, they're like, yeah, OK, that was good. <laughs> that question went away. And both times, I didn't say this, we asked people, hey, would you pay $10 a month for this or not? Right? It's always iffy to ask people if they would pay, if they don't have to actually bust out their wallet and pay you. The first time, though, no one had any interest. It just wasn't there. The second time, what people said is, well, I need, I, I need a 30-day free trial. But if your product does what it says, I would gladly pay you $10 a month. So that was like a night and day difference. And then the other thing is, at the end of the second set of tests, almost every single person, at the, here's your check, thank you for your time with us. You're free to go back to your life. Almost every single person was like, so is this product live now? Can I go use this? We're like, no, no, we're still working on it. They're like, oh, can you email me when it's ready? I'm, you know, so nobody had done that the first time. So we were pretty psyched with that iteration result that we have. Uh, and again, it only took four weeks. It was, we just applied the process, which again, start out with getting clear on your target customer, figure out what their underserved needs are in the problem space, uh, you know, use the Kano model to figure out your value prop, um, specify your feature set to make sure we don't overbuild, create your prototype, and test it with customers. For those the Bay Area or visiting the Bay Area, I run a monthly speaker series. I actually have the co-founder of Tesla, Mark Tarpenning, coming on the 20th. So if anyone's around, you're welcome to come by. You can just go to meetup.com slash lean hyphen product. Um, and the last thing is uh, thanks a lot. And if you have a second to share, sir, if you just hold up your phone with your camera on this QR code, it'll go to a super, super short mobile survey where you can get feedback. Um, and uh, I have time for one question, I think, if anybody wants to ask a question. I'll leave that up. And again, meetup.com slash lean I saw some people trying to take a picture of that. And I'm happy to catch up during the breaks with questions, too. All right. If you could take a second, that'd be great. Let me know what you liked. Uh, oh, uh, one thing, again, I mentioned there's a, a happy hour at Steamworks at 375 Water Street. So make sure you check that out, too. OK. Well, I'm just about out of time. I can go back. Good. I can, let me go one more slide. This is, it's a, just so you all know, it's a six minute walk to the happy hour. Start with the end and work back. That's what they say to do, right? So this is where we're going to at the end of the day. Cool. OK, awesome. Great. Well, with that, uh, thanks a lot. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thanks. I need some traction. You need some traction. Let's get some traction. <laughs>